It's September 1905, north of Alaska. An American ship sighted a small vessel emerging from the Canadian Arctic. It was unusual to sight a ship this far north, so they decided to make contact. They met with the ship's captain, 33-year-old Roald Amundsen, and they couldn't believe his story. He had come from the east, where he and his crew became the first people to cross the Canadian Arctic. This was front page news. Son of the Vikings navigates the Northwest Passage. Amundsen achieves undying fame. The polar regions were the last undiscovered places on Earth. Amundsen spent two years in the Arctic, and during that time a lot had happened. His country, Norway, had declared independence from Sweden, and they were now pursuing an expansive policy in the Arctic. Even though Amundsen wasn't political, the global attention to his insane expeditions in the years that followed became an instrument for Norway. Unwillingly, Amundsen had become a pawn in a geopolitical game. This is Amundsen and the rebirth of Norway with hindsight. The Arctic has a special place in the heart of many Norwegians. The very name Norway is believed to mean the way north. They have a long, rugged coastline that stretches all the way to Russia. This has historically tied communities to the sea. In the late 1800s, Norway had just over 2 million inhabitants. They were one of the richest countries in Europe, with a relatively advanced economy. Communities in the south depended mostly on agriculture and timber, while communities in the west and north depended more on fish and foreign trade. Despite their small size, Norway had the fourth largest fleet of commercial ships in the world. They were commissioned to transport goods all over the globe, but the United Kingdom was their most important partner. But Norway was in a union with Sweden, and the Swedish king controlled their foreign affairs, including relations with the UK. Norway had their own parliament, constitution and legal system, but the foreign sector became increasingly important for Norway, and they wanted to dissolve the union. One of Norway's most outspoken critics on this issue was Fridtjof Nansen. Nansen had made a name for himself a few years earlier, when he became the first person to cross the Greenland ice cap. This had been attempted before by some of the world's most famous explorers, but all had failed. Nansen, then only 28 years old, had a bold approach. He started on Greenland's east coast, where at that time there were no human settlements. This meant that if anything went wrong, it would be impossible to retreat. They were either going to be successful or die. And luckily, they managed to pull it off. This instantly transformed him in a national hero, and it gave him the spotlight. He later attempted to become the first man on the North Pole, where he spent three years on the ice with some of Norway's best and brightest scientists. The expedition received a lot of attention, in Norway and abroad. And even though he failed to reach the North Pole, the expedition solidified his status as a world-class explorer. This is when he decided to leverage his fame for political activism, and particularly to seek an end to the union with Sweden. Norway and Sweden entered negotiations about Norway setting up its own councils in foreign countries. The hope was that this would pave the way to Norway controlling its own foreign affairs. One of Nansen's greatest admirers was Roald Amundsen. He was born in a small village in southern Norway in a family of farmers and sailors. He wasn't particularly interested in politics, but dreamt of becoming an explorer. He was hired as a first mate on a Belgian expedition in the Antarctic when he was just 25 years old, and they became the first team to spend the winter in the Antarctic. After he returned from this trip, he felt ready to lead his own expedition. But he wasn't a rich man. He took on debt to buy a small boat, and some more debt to hire a crew. His dream was to become the first person to traverse the Northwest Passage. This had been attempted by some of the best explorers in human history, and many have disappeared in these waters. Amundsen reached out to Nansen, and to his surprise, he invited him to his house. The two talked for hours, 
And at the end, Nansen signed this picture to Captain Roald Amundsen with wishes for good luck and success on the journey. Amundsen hung the picture in the salon of his ship and a few weeks later, he left the harbor of Oslo to set sail for Greenland. As Amundsen set out for the adventure of his life, tensions in Scandinavia were worsening. The talks between Norway and Sweden broke down, after which Norway unilaterally declared the union dissolved. Swedish officials responded with outrage, threatening with war, saying that Sweden had received a blow in the face and that a peaceful solution is extremely improbable. The world held its breath as an armed conflict could break out at any minute. Nansen traveled to London to speak with British politicians and with the media, and he published several articles in newspapers to make a case for dissolving the Union. Far away from the worries of the world in the Canadian Arctic, Amundsen had no idea of what was happening in his homeland. He had last made contact with the outside world when he left Greenland's northernmost settlement. From here, he had entered the Canadian Arctic archipelago and the weather was good. He could have probably made the crossing in his single season, but he decided to stay longer to have more time for scientific measurements. They docked in this bay and soon discovered that they weren't alone. They befriended a local Inuit family who taught them to hunt and other crucial Arctic survival skills. During the summer, the water was ice free, but during the winter, it froze, changing the landscape into a barren frozen wilderness. Amundsen and his team spent two winters in the bay. They located the magnetic North Pole before finally continuing their trip. It only took them a few days to navigate the narrow channels and to reach the open waters of the Beaufort Sea. The same week that Amundsen crossed the Northwest Passage, in Norway, a referendum was held on dissolving the Union with Sweden, and 99.5% of Norwegians voted in favor. This was the start of the end of the crisis. Norwegian and Swedish diplomats negotiated the terms of an agreement and the Scandinavian crisis believed to be ended. Norway and Sweden peacefully dissolved the Union. This was a momentous political turning point for Norway, right when Amundsen captured the global spotlights. He reached a telegram station in northern Alaska and shared the news of his success. It was published on the front page of the New York Times. Son of the Vikings navigates the Northwest Passage. Amundsen achieves undying fame. He was instantly famous, now standing on similar footing as Shackleton and Peary. Together, they were the three polar stars. Amundsen wasn't particularly interested in politics, but politics was interested in him. Norway was now seeking to define their role in the world and who they are as a people. Polar heroes like Nansen became examples of the abilities and the ideals of the Norwegian people, and Amundsen was the new kid on the block. He was riding on a wave of nationalist sentiment, in a time that the Arctic became of increasingly geopolitical importance. The world was heading towards World War I. It is the dawn of aviation, and technology was now rapidly developing. In 1911, Amundsen beat Captain Robert F. Scott in the race to be the first person on the South Pole. He had made history again and he continued by announcing his plans to also become the first person on the North Pole. But this would prove much more difficult than he had imagined. Amundsen wanted to follow a similar strategy as his childhood hero, Fritjof Nansen, when he tried to reach the North Pole a few decades earlier. Nansen's theory was that the currents in the Arctic moved from east to west. His plan was to sail to the new Siberian islands and to enter the ice sheet, to drift with the ice over the North Pole. If necessary, he would walk the last bit. Amundsen and his team, now in the spotlights of the global news outlets, began prepping for the adventure. In 1918, they set sail. While Amundsen and his team once again disappeared off the radar, Norway was pushing its expansive policies in the Arctic. 
the large Spitsbergen archipelago was disputed and claimed by several countries. They are centrally located in a strategic position to project power in the Arctic. Norway and Russia were operating coal mines on the islands, and many neighboring countries had historical ties to the archipelago. But in 1920, Norway successfully managed to claim sovereignty. Russia was still badly wounded after the revolution of 1917, and Sweden had lost influence for its support of Germany during World War I. This made the conditions favorable for Norway, but it could also demonstrate their historical and their modern ties to the archipelago. After its inclusion in the Kingdom of Norway, the archipelago was renamed Svalbard, and they annexed this island off the coast of Greenland shortly thereafter. Amundsen, in the meantime, was having a stroke of bad luck. His expedition was delayed many times by bad weather. Amundsen had fallen off his ship and broken his arm, and he was attacked by a polar bear just a few days later. He almost died of carbon monoxide poisoning, and the worst thing was that they weren't coming anywhere close to the North Pole. They set sail for Alaska, where they built a temporary accommodation to spend the winter and during those long winter days. He fought, and he changed tactics. These were the early years of aviation. The Wright brothers had just taken their first flight two decades earlier, and Louis Blériot had flown over the English Channel just 10 years after that. Amundsen was deeply inspired by these feats, and he managed to get some funding to buy an airplane. After years of hardship on a small boat in the Arctic, the thought of just flying to the North Pole was very tempting. He shipped the small aircrafts to northern Alaska and prepared for a short test flight. They took off, but only after a few minutes in the air, the plane broke down. He managed to safely return to shore, but this was a major setback. Amundsen had failed to sail to the North Pole, and now he had also failed to fly there. He was out of money, and when all hope seemed lost, he received a phone call. It was Lincoln Ellsworth, heir to a mining fortune. He offered to buy two of the best aircrafts available on the market so that Amundsen can try again. He accepted and proposed to depart from Svalbard. Under the watchful eye of the international media, Amundsen and his crew waited for weeks on end for the perfect weather conditions. When all seemed clear, they took off. It was the first time that Amundsen saw the ice from above. I have never seen anything more desolate and deserted, Amundsen recalled. A bear from time to time I would have thought, but no, absolutely nothing living. They spent eight hours in the air before deciding to land. But as they were going down, one of the engines began to spurt. They managed to safely land, but the plane wouldn't fly anymore. They were now stuck on the ice, 150 miles or 250 kilometers from the North Pole. They spent three weeks on the ice to build an airstrip, and then all crammed into one airplane to head back to Swapa. They had failed to reach the North Pole, and they didn't cross the Arctic as they set out to do. But it didn't matter. They returned to Oslo, and 50,000 people crowded the streets to greet them. They were received by the king in the palace with a reception in their honor. Ellsworth was extremely satisfied and contributed another 100,000 US dollars to help purchase an airship that would be fitted for the Arctic by an Italian company. The handover was a big event, and amongst the invitees was Italy's Prime Minister Benito Mussolini. This was seen as a promotional event for all the countries that were involved, and Norway had its name on the ship. They were ready to fly from Svalbard and aimed to be the first people on the North Pole and the first people to fly over the Arctic. On May 11th, they took off. The ship flew over the North Pole at 1.25 a.m. Greenwich time. 
making Amundsen the first person on both the South and the North Pole. When the airship finally landed in Alaska, it was front page news. Most of the cover of the New York Times was dedicated to this achievement, but also the entire second page and even the entire third page. This shows just how important these events were in that time. These expeditions were considered affairs of national importance. The captains, commanders and people in charge were celebrated as heroes. Their accomplishments were in the name of the king or nation they represented and they embodied the spirit of their people. This was particularly important for Norway as they had just gained independence and they were looking to define its values as a people and its role on the world stage. The success of the Norwegian explorers lent credibility to their claims and it helped establish Norway in the public consciousness as an Arctic nation. If you like this and you want to show your support, you can consider joining my Patreon. I publish a ton of exclusive content there that you may enjoy. And if not, the second best way of showing your support is by watching another video. Here are two more videos for you to consider for your next watch.